one of my very favorite topics in the world, functional behavioral assessments and positive behavioral intervention plans. <laughs> Remember, I'm the, uh, I'm the geek that reads the uh, law stuff. So. All right. And you know what? FBAs and positive intervention plans are, are the answer. Um, everything you've heard all day long has been looking at what's going on and let's sit down, let's strategize, let's come up with some positive supports, something that we can do to help the, the student um, so that the, the behavior that is interfering with learning is less likely to occur. Um, again, I'm going to quote uh, Ross, Dr. Ross Green um, because this quote changed my life as a parent and as a professional. And what he said is, it's our explanation of the behavior that leads directly to how we respond to it. It's our explanation of the behavior that leads directly to how we respond to it. So if, we, if our explanation for a student's behavior is that he's doing it on purpose and he's doing it to be annoying, um, we're going to punish. If our explanation is that this student has a problem, that is the problem, um, then we are more likely to provide support. And one of the best examples of this was uh, when my son was going into fourth grade, he had one of the worst vocalizations, and I'm not going to say it. <gasps> I was afraid she Sa was. Sandra knows the story. So. <laughs> Just think of the worst thing you can think of. Um, <laughs> probably a lot of different thoughts going on. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> so off he goes to fourth grade. Now every year I would go to the school and I would talk to the teachers about Tourette and about my son's disabilities and about his symptoms, but I just couldn't say, hey, this is what my son says. I figured she would hear it soon enough. So <laughs> off he went. So I, I ran into her in October and uh, we were at the mall and she comes up to me and she says, Kathy, you're never gonna believe what happened in school today. I was doing a lesson on Alexander Graham Bell and I said to the class, class, what did Alexander Graham Bell say after he invented the phone? <laughs> Class was quiet. Matthew said, whatever you're thinking. <laughs> <laughs> this teacher said, no, not that. Does anybody have any other? <laughs> That's as good as it gets. Her explanation, if her explanation was he was doing that on purpose, um, to be annoying, to, to get attention, to, to do whatever, she would have punished him. She could have kicked him out of school. But she didn't. And if you want to know what he said, you can ask me privately. Uh, <laughs> it's bad. <laughs> it's bad. Um, especially bad in church. Um, <laughs> but um, her explanation was that he had a disorder. And what she did was she told him loud and clear, you are okay. And she role modeled for the children, he's okay. Different, it's okay to be different. Functional behavioral assessments look at why. Why, why, why? We need to collect clues. Why is the behavior occurring? When does the behavior occur? Where does the behavior occur? When does it not occur? Where does it not occur? And how can we provide supports so that the um, environment is more like where it doesn't occur than uh, where it does occur. Uh, sometimes functional behavioral assessments can be very simple. Uh, nothing more than having the team sit around and talk. I used to help schools with functional behavioral assessments and the very first thing I would do is have the team sit down and talk because you can get a lot of clues that way. Um, bring up some positive things, <laughs> not just the difficult things. Bring up some strengths. Um, one of the easiest that uh, I use as an example, there was a third grade little boy that was blowing in other people's faces. And the teacher, you know, did all the, the check marks on the board and, you know, the stickers and she tried all these things. And uh, I was talking to her one day and she said, you know what, I've never asked him why he blows in people's faces. So he, she went to him and said, why do you blow in other people's faces? And he said, I'm trying to learn to whistle. So she said, can you think of a way to learn to whistle without blowing in people's faces? And he said, I guess I could turn my head in the other direction. That is an entire functional behavioral assessment and positive behavioral intervention plan. And sometimes we make things too complicated. <laughs> we really need to, to look things and, and see things because lots of times the answer is a lot simpler than, than we want to make it. Um, but we need to think outside that box. 
Now, sometimes it is a little more complicated than that. About a week later, she called me and she says, he's blowing in people's faces again. And so we did a little more research. Well, come to find out, we did observations. And the only time he blew in people's faces was when their face was right in his face. Kids with Tourette syndrome, obsessive compulsive with germs, he was blowing the germs back <laughs> at the person. So sometimes it does take a little extra work. Tourette is very complicated, very, very complicated, very, very misunderstood. And even the federal government uh, belie believes that it's complicated. I'm an old hippie, so me and the federal government don't always get along. But um, this one, the federal government got it. In, in the IDA 2004, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, in, two, in the 2004, they did include Tourette syndrome, other, other health impaired. And in the regulations, they provide explanations as to why they've made changes in the law. And I want to read this. Their explanation for putting Tourette under other health impaired, we do believe, the federal government, we do believe that Tourette syndrome is commonly misunderstood to be a behavioral or emotional condition rather than a neurological condition. Therefore, including Tourette syndrome in the definition of other health impairment may correct the misperception of Tourette syndrome as a behavioral or conduct disorder and pr prevent the misdiagnosis of their needs. Isn't that incredible? I think that's incredible. <laughs> the misperception of Tourette syndrome as behavior and prevent the misdiagnosis of their needs. That's the part that I particularly like because what we typically do is we punish. Either that or we develop a contract. We have the kid sign a contract. You're, you're, you're not going to say those naughty words anymore. And if you say those naughty words, then you're going to go to the principal's office. If you go to the principal office three times a week, then you're going to be in school suspension. If you have three, you know, then we go on and on. We punish and we punish and punish rather than looking at how can we help the child. Depending, the IDEA is really clear about if uh, behavior interferes with the learning of the student or the learning of other students, then it says must do a functional behavioral assessment and a behavioral intervention plan. Um, IDEA hardly ever says must any place. So if the behavior is interfering, then they must do this. Um, and I would check with your state. There's, there's some states that have um, memos on functional behavioral assessments. And so your state may have some guidelines on that. I, I know New York State has a wonderful one. Now, I don't know if the administrators in Florida are going to care about the memo for, in New York State. But, um, but, the, but the federal government uh, is pretty clear about uh, that it must. The point you have time of the FBA for is to determine how you can help the child. It's, right. not, a, it's not an assessment to determine that they're emotionally or behaviorally right. disordered. Right, right. It's to come up with a, a plan. Yeah, and, and it's, the not a it's not diagnostic. Right. The functional behavioral assessment is to find out what in the environment, how does the environment impact the child? Um, how, does the how is the uh, environment uh, impacting the behavior? And then how does the school write up a plan to change the environment so that the behavior is less likely to occur? The assessment is not to determine whether or not the child has emotional disorders. The assessment is to determine what in the environment is causing the behaviors. None of us here are going to say that they can do everything with no consequences. Um, but consequences need to make sense and they need to teach. I wanted my son to learn um, how to live in the adult world. So he needed to learn to manage his symptoms. He has learned to manage his symptoms. He's president of his own company, Drum Echoes Incorporated, and he uh, does drum circles and is a keynote presenter and travels around talking about positive interventions and positive supports for kids with pretty significant behavioral issues. Um, it can work. I know it works. I've seen it with my son. I've seen it with many, many, many children. I love functional behavioral assessments. And uh, if, if I've got you interested, we have a, a really good workbook that's on the website. Um, it's a workbook for functional behavioral assessments and positive intervention plans for students with Tourette syndrome, attention deficit, obsessive compulsive. It's the longest titled workbook <laughs> yeah, you're ever going to see. But if you look at the look for the workbook, workbook for functional behavioral assessments and positive interventions. And if you ever have any questions about it, 
I'm available to talk Palmer. about it. <laughs> Should love to talk to you about it. I do. <laughs> Thanks.